Um, so t tonight the theme is, is mobile, and we've got t two actual real mobile people. Um, Sam, who actually has a mobile app development company, and Andrea, who works at Accenture, with a team who's been developing stuff for consumer goods kind of things, actual genuine mobile people. I'm not really a mobile person, but I can talk a little bit about the models, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, so smaller networks, mobile will require smaller. So about me, um, hopefully someone here hasn't seen this before. Um, I'm background in kind of machine learning, uh, startups at finance, and I moved to Singapore in 2013. Basically 2014, I just read papers um, about deep learning, natural language processing, played with robots, played with drones. That was my year of fun. Since then, since 2015, I've had like a serious natural language processing job here with a local company, um, doing natural language processing, some deep learning. I've happened to write a few papers along the way, and we're now just starting, Sam and I are just starting a uh, an eight-week deep learning developer course. So this is something else we can talk about. And also, Google has been good enough to give us a GDE qualification just now. So we're, we're kind of smarting from the shock, anyway. Um, so basically, when we're talking about these kind of, you want it really, OK. Basically, when we're, we're talking about here are CNN models. And the basic flow which I've got here is you put in an image, typically. Typically, this is for visual stuff, though it can also be applied to voice or, or text even. But here, I think the use case is vision. And what you'll do is you'll pass it through a number of neural network layers. Basically, in, at each stage, you've got another little image which it's producing. But at, at each stage, also, the image is subtly different from the layer before. And what, what the game is in training this model is to make it so that these images, by the end of flowing through, have been featureized in such a way that you can then determine what is in the image. So in this case, it would be car. But there will be a whole bunch of categories at the end to try and classify this. And so this is what people have been using CNNs for, and it's suddenly been, I guess since 2012, has been the, like the hottest thing in vision. So, so what's a CNN? Basically, it's using the fact that pixels in an image are organized. They have a, a kind of a layout, a natural relationship with each other, compared to just random inputs from, you know, from sensors around the world. An image has sensors which are organized in kind of a grid. And the idea here is we're going to use the whole of this image as a feature for, our, for the next level of the network. And this will have successive levels, and that's what's going to make a deep network. And the way to which you're going to create these features is by using essentially a Photoshop filter on the previous layer. And a Photoshop filter, in mathematical terms, is a convolutional kernel. And that's why these are called convolutional neural networks, or CNNs. So, Online, there's a thing, at, so this is my little thing, there's a redcatlabs.com. If you go here, and there's also redcatlabs.com slash C, you can actually play with one of these convolutional filters. And basically, you'll take this image as its input, you'll pass it through this little mathematical operator with these parameters, and you'll get out another little image. So if I were to change these parameters, and I, it's super difficult for me to do because I can't see what's going on. If I change the parameters, hopefully, oh, sorry, what I should do, I should go on the, the actual one. If I change these parameters, I can actually start altering the image. So you can see that by changing the parameters, I'm going to have some altered version of this. And the point of that is that if I can now let a model choose the parameters which best suits its purpose, i.e. identifying what's in the picture, the model will learn how to do that in some mysterious way just by updating these parameters. So mathematically what's going on is this CNN filter is taking this image at the back, passing this little matrix across the whole thing, and then summing up the results and multiplying each element by the element under it to produce the answer in the middle. So this is essentially scanning this kernel across the image. But because of the way, say for instance, a GPU is organized, 
it can do this extraordinarily fast. So this is how essentially you take these nine parameters here, and typically you have one extra kind of bias parameter. You'll take these parameters here and you'll map one image into a, an updated image. It could be a blurred, it could be a sharpened, it could have edges detected. Um, basically it will change this into something of a slightly different nature. So what people do with this, and in fact which is what has powered this from the beginning, has been a competition called um, the ImageNet competition, or the I-R-I-L-S-R-R-C, S-V-R-C. So, um, in this competition you have 15 million labelled images which are all of different stuff in 22,000 categories. And the competition is to have, there's a, a thousand of these categories that have been chosen. And the question is, for instance, for this image, which is a picture of a hot dog, which of these categories does it belong to? And so th this is very extremely difficult for me to tell here, but there are various foods along here. And I guess this one has got lots of hot dogs in it. This one's more kind of burgers maybe. So, and the reason that there's this nice display is because this was actually scored by a human. There's a guy who's now head of the uh, Tesla AI called Carpathy, who actually rated himself over weeks of actually doing this manually. And so we, know, we now know that the ImageNet task has got about a 5% human error rate for, for one particular human who went to Stanford. Right? Um, so having got all of these images and the ground truth, people then started training um, vision tasks on this. And up till 2012, people were inching their way up in performance. But when people came along and suddenly did this using the kind of the CNN methods rather than an open CV kind of method, um, <laughs> when the, suddenly the, the field was revolutionized and the error rates came well down. So. Um, Basically, back in 2012, there's a network called AlexNet, which would take in an image here and then pass it through these various blocks of, creating these various blocks of features up until the end when you get to the categories. So what you find is the features which are created at the beginning would be kind of edges or colors. It's just looking for particular pieces of highlighting, particular pieces in the image. And the next level up, or the next few levels, will start to look for textures. Is it seeing fur? Is it seeing cheetah kind of pattern? Or is it brick or, or whatever? But as you start to move further up, it will then be identifying shapes. And then further up still, shapes which are really characteristic, like dog's noses or eyes. So there'll be, as you move further up this hierarchy, you're getting more and more sophisticated features until you get to the actual answer. Now the the crazy thing is that these features are created just within the process of giving it a photo and telling it the category. And there are a thousand categories, many of which are dogs, but it basically learns to do this featureization, including all of this detection of these interim stages, all on its own. Now, interestingly, these also correspond to kind of some of the feature levels seen in the brain, which is suggestive, though, well, it's interesting. So having done this essentially eight layer, 10 layer network, two years later, Google came along and came up with something called Inception One for Google and it. So this is 2014. This is now quite a lot more layers. Um, move along to 2015, the next version of Inception. This is getting quite big network. And basically by increasing the number of parameters, they're able to fit this better and better and better. Um, but the downside of this is the more parameters you've got, the more you've got to store. And if you're on a mobile device, the more parameters you're storing, the bigger your app is. And so in some sense, the push to, to get to the, the highest um, rates of recognition for this task are kind of contrary to what you want for your phone app. So the early models, which would be these ones, are super big. These are hundreds of millions of parameters. Um, the later ones, they kind of, because of this uh, kind of crazy modular design, they've got the parameter count down, but still improved performance. So basically, this is how long it will take to compute. This is how 
well it performs and the size of the circle is how many parameters it's taking. So you can see that there's various trade-offs and people, obviously you want to be up into this corner with a small circle if you can. So what we, what we have is I, I basically I've got a um, maybe da, da, da. Okay. Well. So, so online in my GitHub account I've got a thing called Deep Learning Workshop um, so there'll be links in the presentation and, and in here, which has got all of these examples, including um, you know, how, how essentially lots of different ways of tackling these things. So um, there's convolutions. Da, da, da. So I've got a, a simple example here where I'm going to use this Google Net, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but having loaded up the model, I can give it an image. I then you then have to kind of clean up your image. And what happens is if you print out the maximum argument of the features or the, the predictions, it says this is a tabby, tabby cat. So this is quite, this is a, this is, can work live in my laptop, or not live, it can work quite quickly in my laptop, no GPU required. Um, this is kind of an old network now. I can run it on multiple images in this, this directory. So we've got um, the first one, Siamese cat, which is pretty good. Golf ball for this one, which is not so good, but then it has not seen many owls. Or probably this kind of owl is not in its data set, so it, it, there's no way it can know. Um, Band-Aid, this is clearly not a good idea. Um, nipple, muzzle, golden retriever, not very good. Um, this tabby cat one, yes, it understands that. But it's also interesting that the, like the second best choices would be tiger cat, Egyptian cat, lynx, Persian cat. So it understands the cattiness of this um, just from seeing a whole bunch of these things. That was me. So what about mobile? So what we've seen, or what the history has shown, is that better performance means a larger network in, in most cases. But for mobile, we're going to want to compress this. We're going to want to kind of downgrade or just squeeze these networks or even restructure it so it's more suitable for putting on mobile devices. So I've got just some quick, um, one quick reason for thinking about this is looking at the energy usage. So back up the top here, we've got the energy uses of a 32-bit integer add is 0.1 picojoules. So let's call that one. And then it up, as you go up, the 32-bit float costs you nine. 32-bit integer multiply costs you 37. But to retrieve a parameter from static RAM, like an on-trip cache, costs you 50. And to retrieve it out of main memory costs you 6,400. So you can see that just storing these parameters storing many, many parameters and just pulling them onto pr into processing is much more exp expensive than creating it in place if you can do that. So actually storing the data compressed in any way is a huge win because the compression is free compared to pulling an extra byte, which would cost me 6,400, to creating that byte out of some compression algorithm, which cost me one. I can waste tons of, it, tons of cycles uncompressing compared to just pulling this from memory. So this is one reason why storing a compressed disk system may be in fact free to you because um, pulling it off the disk is more expensive than uncompressing it in your processor nowadays. So compressing and downgrading. There are several techniques which are commonly used. People are interested in sparsity, which is all about how many zeros are in here. Um, can I do this at a lower precision than 32-bit um, and maybe I could quantize these weights in some way. So for sparsity, what people typically do is they will look at the, they will have a pre, this is all assuming you've got a pre-trained network. So basically you take a Google Net or one of these big networks and say, well, let's crunch this down. I'm not going to do anything special from a structural point of view. I'm going to make this, what I've got, as small as possible. So basically I'll look at all the weights and if they're small, I'll set them to zero. And then if I were to start to retrain this, I'll just keep all the zeros at zero because I can store zeros cheaply by having just, it's going to be a bit stream. And I'm going to have a little flag which says, is this a zero or is this a proper number? And so that, it, it may be that 
30% of my weight's just a zero anyway. And so that saved me a third of the model size. Another thing you can do is once you have a, a slightly less precise model, maybe you want to quantize these into kind of byte-wise weights. And in fact, this is the Google's TPUs are a byte kind of, which is a, their fancy new thing for doing computations. They have 64,000 simultaneous 8-bit multiplies. So they're reducing all of their weights to pretty small size and pretty small resolution, but they want to do those hyper fast. So what you're doing when you're trying to train one of these networks, knowing that your resolution of what you're doing is pretty low, is you quantize on the forward pass, because you want to know what you're actually going to get. But when you calculate the gradients going backwards, you kind of cheat and you tell it the, the true gradient of what you're trying to do. And this has been shown to just, it shouldn't work, but it, it shouldn't work in a kind of mathematical sense, but it does work pretty well, so well enough. And what people find is that even if you go down to as low as six bits per parameter, it's probably going to work. So eight bits may be too many. And this is compared to proper scientific computing, which would want 64-bit double precision numbers, this is a whole kind of different world. Um, obviously, storing six bits per parameter is a bit nasty because the bytes won't even line up, but that's a, that's a simple arithmetic operation. The, the last, another simple thing that people do is just quantize the weights. So if you've got a, like the weights in some distribution from like very, very small to around zero to being very, very big, they just say, well, I'm, I just want four, four actual weights that I'll use, so I'm going to pick four separate levels, well, maybe this is a five including zero, four, se four separate levels, and I'll, instead of using the actual weight, I'll use this quantized weight. And then I'll fiddle around with the levels so that it best represents my data. And the point of doing that is, in order to store those weights, and so I might store this for an entire level, say, or entire level in my network, is if I have four buckets, I'll only need to store a two-bit index into my quantization levels, and then I store the quantization levels as well to maybe 8-bit you know, or 16-bit resolution. But I, I know that this, is, you know, th this kind of thing will work really well and, and will compress, well, it is a compression on this stuff which works pretty well. Another thing that people do is start to actually restructure the networks. So in the earlier diagram, I just had a 3 by 3 kernel which I was passing across for my CNN. But people will use 7x7s seven seven or 5x5s five five as well in the big networks. But what people commonly do and then have kind of found that this is an, an interesting uh, simplification is instead of having a, a single 5x5 five five operation, which will have 5x5 five five plus 1 parameters, that's 26 parameters, I can actually just do this by stacking a 3x3 three three on top of a 3x3. Three three. So the actual coverage area of that would be the same as a 5x5, five five, but it's kind of factorized out. Um, so it would be slightly less, um, slightly less flexible in what it can represent, but it saves me parameters. So if I'm having like 50 input, lay or 50 input channels, the first way costs me 26 by 50, which is 1,300. Second way costs me 20 by 50, so it's 1,000. So I've now saved, I guess it's a quarter of, of the, the weights like that. Another thing that people can do is suppose we have a 3x3, three three, um, and this is just ca kind of counting. Suppose we were to do a 3x3 three three over a channel for 50 different input channels. In, in the diagram which I showed, it looks very simple that it was just one plane going into another plane. But the reality is one, when one does a 3x3 three three kernel, it's doing a 3x3 three three times by all the input channels. So all of these parameters are independent. So it allows any any channel or any color in, on the first plane, any channel to interact with any other channel. And that seems kind of excessive, particularly since if I have a 50, 50 channels in my preceding layer, I will have a 3 by 3 plus 1 for bias, so it's 10 times 50, so it's 500 parameters. What people are now playing with is a separable CNN. So for every output channel, you will run one 3 by 3 kernel identically the same over all the input channels, and then you sum up a weighted sum across all the channels. So essentially this is separating out the, the idea of texture, which is kind of the, the within a channel um, shapes, 
versus the interaction between the channels as a different thing. So this is kind of a factorization of the big volume of parameters into something which is now a 3 by 3 by plus 1 times 1, 10 parameters for this kernel, and then 51 parameters for the summing it all up in a weighted way. So I've changed the 500 parameters down to 61. So this is another huge win in making this model smaller. Um, but it, it has made the assumption that this model can be factorized like that. So you have to be careful that the factorization isn't destroying your performance. And so every time you do this, you're going to want to be retraining and retraining or experimenting. And so in my presentation, there's, there's kind of links to, there's a model called Exception, where they started doing this kind of factorization. Um, and then they've started to really highlight what's going on. This is even in a language paper, so a natural language paper. So, um, so in practical terms. It's kind of important when you're building these things, if you're building a model, to understand the trade-offs that are being made. On the other hand, most of the time, you're going to be using a predefined model. So the very common thing for doing these tasks is to go to Google, or TensorFlow in particular, there will be a model zoo, download the weights for one of these networks, and just use it. And typically, rather than categorizing this as being tabby cat or golf ball, you will take off one of the top layer and then do what's called transfer learning. Or you'll use it in various other, you'll kind of abuse these pre-trained weights. But, but because Google has done all of this work, you can down download a pre-trained network, which is all fully optimized in, in two shakes of a lamp tail. So um, using these predefined models is super easy. There should be hardware coming to phones soon. But and this is why I guess Apple is coming up with their own kind of interface for these things, because they're soon going to want to put in hardware which will do this. So you won't, but you wouldn't see that um, on the surface. So for SqueezeNet, I mean, so here's, I just added this kind of completeness in models. They've got AlexNet level accuracy, which is the, one of the, the first huge advance in, in this stuff, but with 50 times fewer parameters. So this is now a model which has less than half a meg of parameter set. So this is something which you could easily put, is, I mean, half a meg is, is less than, you know, less than many JavaScript libraries. It's kind of, this is, it's quite a small model. So, and this has a variety. They play around with these one by one and three by three layers. They even eliminate the fully connected layer at the end because that's kind of parameter heavy. Um, what's now appeared in TensorFlow and is available in TensorFlow Slim is a whole thing called MobileNet. So you can see that here are some of the original ones, which is Google Net, Google and Net. There's the VG16. This is a log scale. So, here's AlexNet. The mobile nets, basically, you can choose higher performance, smaller models, and many fewer operations. But you can also, do, you can also look at the trade-off in performance versus the model size. So basically, by tra changing one parameter, and they have all these pre-trained parameter sets set up for you, you can choose whatever model you want and how, however accurate you, want it, you need it to be. Um, the way you do this in Keras, which is also coming into TensorFlow soon, but is fully TensorFlow aware, um, there's now a mobile net thing in Keras, which enables you to essentially you import mobile net. If you pre-process the image like they want, you just say model equals mobile net, predictions equals model predict of image. And that will give you the, that is all you would need to do for a Keras kind of model. And it's all pre-baked. The first time you run it, it will download the, the parameters it needs. So in wrapping up, so basically, you've got to understand what kind of structure you're playing, what kind of structure is underlying. Because if you're going to want to cut up the network, you're going to need to know where it can be cut. So if I'm just doing a simple transfer learning, I can cut it off at the end. But if I'm going to do something more clever, like a and like an, a style transfer, where I need to look at some intermediate layers, you've got to understand where's good cut points to put. And your small model may not have these cut points because it's been sliced and diced in such a way. Um, but for many, many tasks, particularly for mobile like app use cases, tiny models are pretty good and they work well enough. Um, but there's a whole lot more 
behind this, obviously. So, um, just as a quick, this obviously you, you probably know about the deep learning meetup group here, um, since you're here. Um, our next meetup is going to be on the 21st of September. Um, here again, we've got this, certainly someone from the Google, actually a native Singaporean, coming from the Google Brain team in uh, Mountain View. He's going to talk about some of the, the new and up-and-coming stuff. And I'm sure we have some other cool stuff to fill it out, but we're kind of focusing on him for the moment. Um, but what we always try and do is have talk which is, addresses stuff for people starting out, something kind of from the bleeding edge, and we'd love to have more lightning talks. So if anyone has anything they can be enthusiastic about and are willing to talk for five minutes, everyone would love to hear it. It's like there, there can be no disaster lightning talks. So. Another thing which I think Sam will talk a little about a bit at the end is, and we've been pre-announcing this for a long time, the eight-week developer learning, the eight-week deep learning developer course we're actually going to start it, and it's going to be starting on the 25th of September. And the format will be twice weekly, three hour sessions, which will include both instruction, so teaching, slides, Python books, whatever, but also individual projects. Because we figure that someone doing an interview or building you know, their resume needs to have actual projects which they have ownership of. One of the problems with doing you know, Udacity course, I mean, there, there are great courses out there, is that even though you did the coursework, in an interview, all you can really say is, I did this really interesting topic like everyone else did. What we'd aim to do here is make this very individual so that the project that you do is yours. And so I'm, I'm not sure what people will want to, to look at. Maybe it's their own heart rate Fitbit measurements or their cat feeding patterns or wh whatever it is or they want to do something really jazzy with images or text or whatever. Bring, or even something for their company. Bring it along. We can do, you can do that. We can make sure it, you, know, you get something worth talking about at the end of it. Um, the cost of this, for regular cost of this, is going to be 3,000 Sing dollars. But because we have now S WSG funding approved, um, Singapore citizens and PRs can get like a 70% rebates and we can work with the company to make that happen or make with your employer or however it works we'll try and make that happen um, if you want to have a look at some more details there's a website address called reddragon.ai slash course so we previously sent this out um, during the week to everyone who kind of pre-registered um, I encourage people to have a look even if you pre-registered and were wondering shall I bother have a look and you'll see what kind of content we're covering um, I guess one of our FAQs is, well, what about the Andrew Ung course, which is, is kind of out there? Um, we would kind of not, not set ourselves against that. We would probably, there's a, one called the Jeremy Howard, who's, it, we, we're kind of aiming at, at getting the stuff into people's hands practically. So understanding it from the very basics is very good, but we want to have like the newest and hottest stuff. If there's a new paper, we want to be talking about it. So, and we want to do the practical stuff, which is going to be difficult to do online. And it's not going to be easy. And questions. While I set up, you, or while you set up. Okay. So. Put this over here. I'll take questions while he does his thing. <laughs>